So good afternoon, everybody, on this wet uh, afternoon in Vancouver. Just wanted to welcome you all to um, the session this afternoon. Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Bruce Reed. I'm a regional manager of the Oceans Program for Fisheries and Oceans Canada in Pacific Region. Within Fisheries and Oceans, the Oceans Program leads work in establishing marine protected areas and engaging in integrated oceans management planning. Planning for different uses of spaces in the ocean is relevant to both of these program areas. The exercise of planning how ocean spaces are used is catching on around the world for a variety of reasons and is becoming commonly referred to as marine spatial planning. So we're very pleased this afternoon to have an expert on marine spatial planning, Bud Ehler, to tell us more about it. But before I introduce Bud, I wanted to thank the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation for uh, funding uh, Bud's uh, visit here to speak to all of us and for enabling us to webcast Bud's presentation to people tuning in across Canada. I'd also like to acknowledge the role of Coastal First Nations, having played and working with DFO to arrange for Bud's visit. I also want to quickly outline our plan for this afternoon. After this presentation, there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers with Bud. We will facilitate this by keeping a list of people with questions and providing you with a microphone to allow you to, uh, for those on the webcast, to hear your questions. Also, as a reminder, we're going to be passing around a sign-up sheet, and so make sure you, you put your name on it if you haven't done so up front. And my final reminder, please turn off your cell phones and Blackberries so we don't have any interruptions. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our, our guest speaker, Bud Ehler. So Bud Ehler is president of Oceans Visions, a consulting company specializing in integrated oceans management, uh, ocean coastal and ocean management and marine spatial planning. He works in Paris, France, primarily as a consultant to UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the Man and the Biosphere Program and other international organizations, national governments and non-government or organizations. Before moving to Paris in 2005, he worked as a senior executive for the U.S. National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration for 27 years, leading international and national programs in integrated coastal management, strategic environmental assessment, marine pollution monitoring and assessment, oil spill response, and natural resource damage assessment. He worked for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Research and Development from 1973 to 1978, and taught regional planning and resource, natural resource management at the University of Michigan, the University of California at Los Angeles, and the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He was the Marine Vice Chair of IUCN's World Commission on Protected Areas from 2000 to 2005. In 2007, he received an award from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for his work on coastal adaptation and its contribution to the award of the Nobel Prize to the IPCC. He is the author of over 90 publications, including most recently a UNESCO Guide to Marine Spatial Planning. So please give a warm welcome to Bud Ehler. Thank you, Bruce. I want to make sure everything is working here. The mic is okay, right? Well, it's a pleasure to be here in sunny Vancouver on a real marine day. Uh, whenever people claim, complain about the ocean, especially those that worked in NOAA, I always said, well, you know, this is what do you expect the weather to be in the marine environment? And it's usually like this. So uh, I appreciate everyone coming. I was trying to figure out why the crowd was so big until I saw the food in the back of the room and I realized that uh, there's a free lunch here. But there is no free lunch, so you've got to listen to me for at least about uh, 30 or 40 minutes. Talk about marine spatial planning, which is very dear to my heart for some of the reasons that uh, Bruce already uh, described in terms of my involvement with this field. I've had the uh, honor of working on marine spatial planning at UNESCO, sort of starting a program there to uh, get oceanographers and marine science people focused on a real practical application of the kind of information and knowledge that marine scientists have. It's difficult to do sometimes because, again, this is a real applied field and one that is increasingly important and I hope that you can uh, 
be convinced by some of the things that I'm going to talk about and show you more importantly, because I've got a lot of uh, maps, and I apologize for the screen. It was a trade-off between uh, being able to see some, some of this from the back of the room and having a brighter screen, so I uh, hope you bear with us on the, uh, on the graphics and that you can see this. No, no, no let's, let's just leave it the way, way it is unless... No, it's not, that doesn't bother me. I'm going to move around. Yeah, that's okay. If I'm blinded, I can at least talk. Uh, <clears throat> marine spatial planning is increasingly applied to the marine environment for a number of reasons. Um, it's not a new idea. In fact, the Great Barrier Reef was doing marine zoning, at least, 35 years ago. And I think most of you uh, are aware of the, what the Great Barrier Reef uh, is, at least, and, and the fact that they do run through a series of zoning uh, approaches to designate particular areas of the park as different use zones. I'm going to talk more about that because I think it's a good example of some of the things I'm going to talk about, although not a good example of all of the things I'm going to talk about. But this is a quote from uh, Scientific American, uh, last month's issue, that said basically the time when we could do anything we want anywhere in the ocean is over. And that basically means that uh, there's such intense use of many of the areas of the ocean that we have to figure out a way to share the space that uh, we would like to have. I'm going to point out, I hope, why some parts of the ocean are more important than others and how planning and zoning can uh, help us deal with that issue. Uh, this is not an, er an area that is new to many parts of the world. As I said, the Great Barrier Reef has been doing it for a long time. There are other applications of planning and zoning in protected areas in other parts of the world besides the Great Barrier Reef. But more importantly, the use of an application of spatial planning ideas is increasingly being used for multiple objective planning and multiple uses of the marine environment, particularly in Western Europe. And again, I'm going to come back and talk more about some of those applications. So truly, the idea of marine spatial planning, I think, is an idea whose time has come. These are some of the questions that I'm going to try and uh, address in the, in the next 35 or 40 minutes. What's the need for spatial planning? Is there really a need for it? Why is time and space important in the marine environment? What are some of the benefits of planning? How can spatial planning really help us to move toward ecosystem-based management? We, many of us sort of espouse that idea, but not many people know how to do it. And I think spatial planning is one of the tools that can at least move us in the right direction. And then more importantly, I want to talk about some practical applications and what we can learn for the, about the future of spatial planning from what has already happened in many parts of the world. So why do we need spatial planning? <clears throat> this, is, I hope, is a map that many of you have seen. It's from Science Magazine, I think February of last year, I believe, about a year ago. And it's been done by a... a team led by Ben Halpern at the University of California at Santa Barbara that basically tried to accumulate a lot of data to demonstrate that, in fact, many marine places are under increasing development pressures. There's no, literally no area except some places that are in extreme places that are untouched by human activity. And this human activity includes traditional uses of the ocean. Fishing is pretty obvious. Marine transportation would be another one. Sand and gravel extraction, these things have gone, gone on for a long time. But there's also increasing pressures from technological change, new technology, for new demands for ocean space, and this is the big driver in many of the places in Western Europe, particularly wind farms, are competing with other traditional uses for ocean space. But there are other technologies, including the one on the lower left, which is a wave energy converter and increasingly offshore aquaculture. And spatial planning, again, is, is very important in places that are being developed uh, 